question. Um, okay, regarding in process, a uh, progress. So EI is actually Emerging Leaders Asia. So I'm, uh, I'm Jin Kai and I will be moderating today's discussion on thriving on a post-pandemic world and specifically what we can learn from what's changed during the current pandemic. So I believe a lot of you here find the thoughts of getting into the work Force is challenging and daunting, especially in times of pandemic. So with that in mind, we are really fortunate enough to get some personal insights from three young and bright professionals as our panelists today. And just before that, just a few housekeeping rules. So please stay muted during the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to type into the chat box and we can answer your questions accordingly during our Q&A sessions. And also just a brief introductions of ELA. We call ourselves as Emerging Leaders Asia, but we actually are alumni of Aksata Young Talent Program, where we spend um, two weeks or two years together getting intense training, business simulations and compet competitions, stuff like that. And we we as an alumni, we have a lot of interesting public events, like for example, um, that really revolve around, around um, personal and career development. And yesterday we launched our master classes with Vijaya CEO, Mr. Jalil Rashid, which is interesting, insightful and really exciting. And we have we are going to have more coming up. So do stay tuned. And next year we have also our flagship event on Future CEO Summit, where everyone can everyone here can join. So let's get started. So joining me with today we have Dinesh. He is a president of and CEO of Emerging Leaders Asia. And he is a graduate trainee of Unilever. Outside of work, he has been actively and passionately coaching people from all walks of life. And most importantly, he also he was also a TEDx speaker and international judge for over 100 public speaking competitions across the world. And next, we have Eunice, and she is the Chief People Officer at Emerging Leaders Asia. She also working as a social media lead for Settle. She literally lived and breathed social media in the past seven years. She, she's not only an expert in social media campaign, content creations, and most importantly, she grabbed numerous awards along the way. And outside of work, she enjoys adventurous sports and also music and cooking. And last but not least, we have Vicky. So Vicky is a graduate from the University of Oxford and University of Durham, which study education and law respectively. And apart from that, she is also the project director um, of Action Learning Project in Emerging Leaders Asia. She's currently working as a business strategy and development at Sunway Property. Outside of work, she has her own startup Ad, which is to design fun, effective, and personalized education content for all the users. So let's just get started into the discussion. Let's start with a very simple and fun question. So describe a word or a sentence when you started off with this virtual settings in your workplace. Probably let's get started with um, Dinesh. What do you think? Well, how do you feel when you started off this kind of virtual setting in your workplace? I, I think the one word I would use is chaotic because I'm an extroverted person and putting me into these four walls and house was very chaotic. So I think the word that I'll go for is chaotic. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Vicky, what do you think? Hi, I will actually use the word excited because uh, I definitely don't believe that work only starts when you're in the office. And then it's nice to, you know, prove to the bosses that you can actually do productive work at home. So it was uh, exciting to see that uh, we managed to change the minds of some of the bosses. Okay, what, what about you, Eunice? Jinka, I just want to clarify, did you say question, uh, did your question say a word or a sentence? Yeah, a word or a sentence. A word or a sentence. Okay, then I'll just go with word lah for the simplicity okay. sake. Um, my word is flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually a opposite with uh, Dinesh. Dinesh is an ENTJ. I am an ISFP, so I'm introverted. Mm -hmm. And I actually do like this work from home situation where you can just tune into calls, 
and a specific time, let's say 45 minutes, that's it, you shut off and then you can do anything else you want. So flexible is the word for me. Good to know, it's, it's really diverse, you can see chaotic. Some mentioned that excited and some mentioned flexibility. So let's get more in depth into the discussion, right? How has the pandemic changed the future of the workforce? Especially um, all of you guys from different industry, I'm pretty sure it's quite different. So you mentioned about chaotic, right, Dinesh? So how does the future workforce will be like um, in, in the FMCG or in the HR department? What do you think, um, Dinesh? Right, so this is a very common topic among HR practitioners now, right? Because we are forced to look at things in a very different light. So I think because of this pandemic, the work we do have changed. The workplace is also changing. So we have moved from, you know, 100% being in physical now to hybrid concept. Or some offices and companies are already looking into 100% virtual. You just stay at home and get your work done. So I think beyond just the work, I think also how do you keep your people engaged uh, becomes a big issue as well. Because if you're working from home, like I think Vicky said, uh, it's really nice, it can be productive and all. But I think for a lot of us, the, the biggest challenge is how do you draw the line between your personal and professional life, right? Because now you see these two are getting into one. So I think moving into the future of work, the biggest challenge is for us to unlock that. And we need new capabilities. The competencies we look for in a, in a current world is very different from what we looked for those days. So I think the competencies, the type of work we do has changed and the workplace is also changing. So yeah, it's gonna be a rapid change and we are all just embracing that as we go. Yeah. It's, it's a really HR approach where we, where we mentioned about how do we really get people to engage, right? What about in the digitalized sector, um, like social media, right, Eunice? What, 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 what's, the, what's the future of workforce in the um, social media or digitalizing sectors looks like for you? Mm, frankly speaking, social media content creation is a very in-demand skill, especially amongst... Uh, growing companies now because everything is digital. So brands and even SMEs, they're all scrambling to actually mm -hmm. set up their own social media presence and also have sufficient content to engage with people. But I think the other advantage that uh, students or like young professionals stepping out into the workforce, what they can actually focus on is actually to build their own brand on social media. So um, with the likes of like TikTok, everyone can be famous these days, but there is something for everyone. And the best advice for this is to actually not be shy. Don't shy away from social media. Um, put yourself out there. That would be the advice Yeah, to give you that upper hand. That's a very interesting one because you mentioned about how everyone can be really famous right now and how can we use really use um, social media to be personal branding as well as a corporate kind of branding as well, right? What about Vicky? You, you're working in a property sector as well as working in a startup industry, right? So how, how does the um, pandemic change the future of this sector in terms of workforce and employability industry? Um, so the workforce in, uh, let's say, like the property industry, right, isn't that much different from other conglomerates or other MNCs. Huh? But I can share, you know, the thoughts that uh, I have about, you know, working virtually and also uh, for my colleagues. Uh, what I see is that uh, there is this blurring of boundaries between like your home life, your family life, and also your work life. Uh, and I also personally feel that uh, I work a lot harder because it's online, maybe because because uh, of course we are more, I would say for me, because I don't have kids, uh, I'm not married yet. So uh, I don't have other commitments. I can just fully invest in my work. But I know that there are other, uh, my colleagues who are young mothers, uh, then because the kids are not in school, they have to juggle both uh, their domestic uh, life and also their, uh, their work commitments. Uh, another reason why I think we work harder uh, is that we are compensating for, you know, not being in the office. We try to tell ourselves that, okay, our bosses are not there uh, then because we uh, have to be very committed and dedicated uh, to our work. Then we try to work longer hours to show that, you know, even though we're working from home, we are still very productive. Um, for, for the startup scene, okay, startups are, I mean, when they first start, they have to be lean. Uh, but there are different ways of being lean, but 
I guess that being online gives us the, the rights and the passport to be extremely lean. So we don't need an office and uh, we don't have to expect people to, uh, to, to tell them, that, oh, it's actually good to work from home. But now that everyone is used to working from home, uh, then when we publish, like uh, when we want to recruit, uh, then it's much easier to uh, onboard them because people are used to working from home. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's it's really interesting as well. Um, it's 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 revolving around how to make the boundaries really clear, and also as Dinesh mentioned, how to engage people during this time. What about um in terms of more to like the industry kind of insights? How does the um um property um works differently com compared to um pre pandemic, and also the startup industry? How how does it different in terms of the industry? What do you think, Vicky? Mm, okay, so, so let's start with uh, property. So because my work is not uh, client-facing, so I do a lot of uh, market research and I have to formulate like recommendations to the uh, to the board. So, uh, so previously, so I joined a company during the pandemic. So I didn't, so I don't really know what it was like before, but from what I know is every time we uh, assess a deal or we want to, you know, acquire an asset, a company, or even a piece of land, we have to go, we have to do like site visits and usually it's multiple site visits. But now because of uh, technology like uh, Google Maps, so we had Google Maps before, but in the past, uh, the senior management wasn't that, uh, that they didn't trust like Google Maps uh, completely. Uh, but because now we don't really have a choice, I think everyone uh, from top to uh, bottom, everyone is starting to uh, trust the system. And I would say that we are uh, doing it more efficiently. So in the past, when we do like a project, probably we evaluate like one asset, it will take uh, four or five days. Uh, but now I think we can do it very quickly. I would say one week we do uh, five to even 10 different types of evaluations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but for, for the uh, for startup, I think there's a lot of job opportunities there because the pandemic has accelerated a lot of growth in uh, a lot of key verticals. I'm sure that you guys uh, know, for example, in healthcare, uh, in ad tech, insure tech, fintech, and even prop tech. So um, don't limit yourself to you know, just a specific industry. For example, if you like property, you like to be in real estate, doesn't mean you have to be in a developer or development company. You can actually be in prop tech, you know, combining something you love with uh, technology so that you can always be innovative. Okay, okay, it's really interesting to, to know that you get a job during the pandemic itself and, 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 and so, wow, because a lot of people um, have the difficulties during this kind of pandemic sessions to really find um, something to do. Just to get back to the question, uh, just to get back to the um, the one that um, Dinesh mentioned, right? engaging with um, um, with people, where, where company have started to look into how to engage people more. So, um, I think there's a question coming in. Do you think work from home will be something that continues after the pandemic um, is over? Would you prefer it to? I think this question could directly direct to um, Dinesh. What do you think? I am, I am absolutely certain that it will continue. Uh, especially, I think, if you are working in a, in, a, in a big company, like big MNCs and all, a lot of MNCs have already declared that uh, we'll never go back to how it was. Like Unilever globally, we've already said that five days that office may never come back, right? We are all looking into hybrid workforce and hybrid working home. Would I prefer that? Um, honestly, I, I, I think at the start it was challenging, right? But then later you do realize that things are easy. And while I don't have any commitments now, like what Vicky said, you know, I'm not married, or I don't have kids. I only have annoying pets that, you know, intervenes whenever I'm having a call. Apart from that, I don't have any other commitments. So I think I'm perfectly fine going into that. But I think to answer the question, I'm very confident that we are now moving into an era where I think working from home is going to be a big part of our life in a corporate setting. Obviously, if you are a medical student, I think you need to go to the hospital. I don't think that's going to come to home. But I think in a corporate setting, when work can be done hybrid and from home, I think the way we are headed in the future is definitely, yeah, we are headed to the place where it's going to be working from home or you can work anywhere. I think that's the concept now. You, as long as you get your work done, you whether you want to work in Starbucks, you want to work from home, you want to work from your car, anything, but just get the work done. So COVID has accelerated that thinking to come forward a lot. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that, Dinesh. It's, it's not only accelerate the way of working, but also accelerate the trust between people and, and the, the boss and the manager itself, right? What about in terms of the uh, social media industry as well as the property? Do you guys think that the, when, when the pandemic is over, um, work from home will be something that will be continued, um, Eunice? Social media and property or just social media? Social media first, yeah, social media. Okay, so um, firstly, I have a friend who actually works in property and she personally struggles as well with working from home because it's difficult for property agents to actually like work from home unless they digitize the entire process, which they're doing uh, through EDMs, email blasts, uh, WhatsApp conversations. But to actually get the sale close, to close the deal, usually your customers would want to see the house. They would want to walk in and see the showroom, uh, be sold on, you know, envisioning how it would look like for their future family. So things that, services that require that physical touch, you will still have to be physically present. Like what Dinesh said, you have to go to the hospital. But for those um, people like me, people like myself, uh, I've been working in social media, like this industry for more than seven years now. So it's only the past two years that I've actually fully worked from home, uh, effective the lockdown. So that's April 2020. And similar to Wiki as well, I changed my job during the lockdown, during the pandemic. So I was previously with ADA in March 2020. And in April 2020, I joined Coke, uh, Coca-Cola. And in May this year, I joined Subtle. So I changed my job twice during the pandemic, but that is um, only specific to my industry because social media, you can still work from home as long as you can coordinate well with the designers, the content creators, the leaders to get approvals done. Everything can be done on Gmail, Google Suite, and content goes up. And I can actually work literally from anywhere. If the borders are not closed, I would probably be working from Penang. So I'm from Penang. Uh, that's my hometown. But um, yeah, so on that as well, right? If you think about it, the opportunities for remote work is, think beyond Malaysia. You can actually mm -hmm. be working. So let's say if you're really good at what you do, you have a niche, you identified that niche very early on in your career, you focus on it you can actually write copy or design for a company that's based in US or Beijing and be paid in USD because remote is, we are actually in the future already. Like we, we personally experienced this and we are experiencing it now. So how you want to go about positioning yourself to be able to do that is also uh, a key differentiator. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with you, Eunice. You did mention about how can the freelancers industry really search during this pandemic and post-pandemic as well, because there are more trust in um, the, the, the company to the employee itself, right? So definitely looking forward, uh, Eunice, for you, you work like, probably in Paris sometimes and then with a US or Malaysia company, right? So we, we talk about the proper, um, the social media industry and, and touch a little bit about the property industry. So we keep building that um, post-pandemic, people will have more trust of um, having having to look the house online instead of getting to the, the, the main places itself. What, what, what do you think in terms of this um, in, uh, property industry? Um, okay, so right now, I think it's because there are no other options, so you have to do it virtually. So, uh, you know, buying a house is probably one of the biggest purchases you ever make in your uh, entire lifetime. And with such a big purchase, you want to visit the uh, show galleries, you want to see the quality of the uh, furnishing. Um, so initially, uh, when we started to go into this lockdown, uh, we saw very large uh, drops, uh, not just for somewhere property, but also uh, in uh, our competitors. Um, but because the MCO has been so long, I mean, we can't be, you know, having no sales for months, right? So the good thing is it has accelerated that growth in uh, virtual viewing. So basically, you can see the entire 
uh, the entire unit, all the rooms, and even the finishing uh, using virtual reality. And at first, people were quite doubtful. They just use it to oh, just get to know more about the property. And then once the MCO is over or when lockdown restrictions are lifted, then they close the deal. But now we have seen more people uh, closing the deal during this entire MCO, even before meeting the agents uh, in person. Uh, but that is the reality of it. It's because of MCO, we don't have other options. But once lockdown restrictions are lifted, uh, I don't think that people will rely solely on this method. It would perhaps be a hybrid of uh, viewing it online, uh, even on websites like iProperty, Property Guru, and then visiting uh, the showrooms. But I do think that because of uh, the because of technology, it gives us more options. So we don't just uh, view like one listing or one uh, development. Uh, we can basically compare, uh, for example, five different developments at the same time. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also can see a lot of people posting their TikTok, um, different kind of property um, kind of stuff on TikTok to just let others to really see, have, have a glimpse of the house itself, right? So um, previously we did mention about personal branding and, um, and I literally believe that um, social media is always the it's not always okay it's, it's a really good platform to bring people together uh, with shared experiences right so um when we look into the uh, future skills that will be highly valued um post-covid Dinesh what do you think that it's a uh, it's, it's something that can be developed through personal branding social media and, and what other professional skills that can be developed um post uh, that, that will be highly valued post-covid Right. Thanks for that, Jin Kai. So I think on personal branding itself, I can always say that a lot of people, when they apply for a job, they think that their resume is that first touch point, right? Like you, you submit your resume and then you get shortlisted for the interview. Then you will always think that your hiring manager's first touch point with you would be when they see you in the interview. But I can assure you, I think 70% of the time when you submit a resume and we, when you know who the person is going to be interviewing, I think it's a common practice for people to just look you up on LinkedIn. And a lot of people don't realize this, you know, a lot of people really don't see this. And so, and obviously I don't think people will go to the extent of Facebook or Instagram because I don't think uh, that you will, they will find anything, right? But LinkedIn is like really a place where people on a professional level will see. So I remember sometimes I, uh, I do have, you know, whenever I shortlist someone to interview, right? And then I check them on LinkedIn, I go like super confused because for some of the information there will be like, either like written like probably eight, nine years ago, or sometimes the way how they carry themselves on LinkedIn can be so confusing, especially if somebody uses like, you know, SMS language on LinkedIn and et cetera. So that, uh, that will, to a certain extent, I will obviously give that impression, right? So I think uh, importantly, when it comes to personal branding, I'm a big believer of LinkedIn. I think most of you here would also be big believers of LinkedIn. So while you're on LinkedIn, also do ensure that your profile is kept in a good manner, because if people view it, what kind of impression you want them to land at, right? At the same time, don't be very confusing. Like I know I've seen this one person who had like 50 tags of names, 50 tags of things under the bio. It's like world shifter, global trotter, like, you know, this challenger, that challenger. I'm like, I, I so what? You want to you wanna like rule the world or you want to do what? Like, so I think uh, that kind of impression sometimes we don't realize. So I think that's one. What kind of skills are very future fit? I think a lot of us would agree data drivenness. Data is here to stay. Even, even in fields like HR, like last time HR was seen as a very like, oh, it's all about the people, you care for people, I can tell you no. We don't really only care for the people, we care for the business. And even in our decisions we do, we put data as the nucleus or as a forefront, right? So there's this one meme that said, in God we trust, everything else needs data. I wholeheartedly agree to that. Because it's very easy, like it's no longer like he said, I said, Donald Trump said, Say you know, this person said, that person said, right? It's really about what is the data telling us? What are consumers looking for? What are the current trends? So I think if you have the time to upskill yourself, pick up data, pick up Microsoft Excel, I regretted a long, 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 I regretted really bad, not really learning Excel until I started working and then I was suffering almost every day. So I think these skills are, are, are things that you can easily pick up. And now we live in a world where there are a lot of people who are sharing these things, right? If you go on LinkedIn, a lot of people do share about what are the future fit skills and etc. So I think as students these days, you guys are very fortunate 
because you have unlimited resources to all these things that you can tap on and work on yourself before you apply for a job or before you hit the workforce. So yeah, I think uh, that answers your question, Jingtai. Yeah, that, that's really that's really true. Uh, when people look for uh, any kind of employee, the first thing they would do is definitely go to the link in uh, Instagram and social media might be the second. But, uh, and also we talk about data driven. Um, Microsoft Excel is a very important skills as well because everything we need to like determines through the data. And yeah, so what, what do you think, Eunice? Um, what are the professional skills will be highly valued in, in the uh, marketing kind of sector? Marketing specifically? Okay, so I guess I come from a place where it's a little bit different for like a fresh grad to like uh, envision, but I'll give advice uh, and further elaborate from what Dinesh has shared. In terms of uh, social media presence, your brand presence matters not just on LinkedIn. It doesn't stop there because I personally have experience of my previous Coca-Cola employer checking me out on Facebook. So how I knew this is because she accidentally sent me a friend request right after our interview on Facebook. So that's how I know, oh, she was checking me out on Facebook. So it doesn't just end on LinkedIn. And I guess the reason why it was on LinkedIn because that uh, employer did not have a LinkedIn account. But she has a Facebook account. So she checked me out on Facebook. So branding yourself does not just stop there. And besides branding, if you're looking for future fit skills, data is one. But data is like so huge, specifically one in data. I personally feel that um, skills in terms of telling a story, having a narration or analysis based on the data is a very valuable skill. So what this means is in the sense of marketing, if you see how Spotify does it on their billboards, how many X number of people have been listening to this song and then they have a very catchy uh, tagline. So it's putting a story to that data. That skill is valuable. Uh, besides putting a story to the data, having visualization abilities. So you know how to use Tableau, you know how to use Power BI, um, and what's the one? Google Data Studio as well. So personally, all these things are skills that you can actually start to build or immerse yourself in. Find opportunities in your council or your activities and try to like practice it before you start working. Or even when you start working, try to find ways, how can I implement this in my work, in my day-to-day? -day? Because this will be very equivalent to like breeding uh, three years from now. Because you can see like the job descriptions and the demands uh, getting more and more. And it's, it's not to say like it's a skill that you have to have, but it's like, it goes without saying, you should know this. So it's sort of like an expectation that future employers would actually have, or even current employers. Yeah, yeah, totally agree, Eunice. You did mention further about what that data means and how can we just make a story and explain it to people who don't really understand the numbers and stuff, which is really, really important. I totally agree with that. Um, what about in terms of property, Vicky, um, or in terms of the um, education technology or startup part? What, what do you think that is the professional skill that require it and highly value uh, post-COVID? Okay, so the skills that I will share, I don't think they are limited to like the property industry. I think it's probably uh, relevant to anyone who wants to be in uh, strategy, in business strategy, uh, or even in uh, business development. Um, so I'm a bit more traditional. Uh, so I would say that the two key areas that you would need, okay, so half traditional, two key areas would be one is corporate finance, uh, and the other one will be technology. So, so let me explain why these two areas Yes, you need to at least have a working knowledge. You don't need to have very in-depth knowledge. So for example, corporate finance, you don't need to, uh, I mean, some of you may already have the uh, CFA, but uh, in a lot of roles, you don't necessarily need to have a CFA, but you need to have working knowledge of corporate finance. You need to know how to talk finance so that uh, in business meetings, you know how to carry yourself with confidence and you know, because it all boils down to how much money we can make. 
right? So you need to be very familiar with those terms instead of relying on uh, someone in uh, the company's finance department. The other part about technology is that, uh, so, so I myself, I didn't study tech uh, and I don't claim to know a lot about tech, but I think it's really important to at least understand the framework, the structure behind it, so that you know how to leverage tech in your business. So two key areas, uh, corporate finance and te technology. And I think that for this generation, you guys are very lucky to have all the opportunities uh, to, uh, to become you know, proficient in these two areas. You have uh, massive open online courses such as like Coursera, and then you only have to pay something, a, a small fee, something affordable uh, for you to uh, be familiar, to be familiar not just with the uh, terminologies, the frameworks, the structures, uh, in order to know enough to be, uh, to be very flexible and also all-rounded in your careers. Yeah, all around it, it's um, it's really well said. I resonate a lot with the corporate finance and technology part. Even um, I myself from the energy industry, I really need to you know understand the finance, the, the money behind the data behind, um, as well as the technology, how things work as well. And you mentioned about top finance, which is um, how how to present the finance. It's it's actually similar as what um Eunice mentioned, how to narrow, how to put a story to the data and to the number itself. So, yeah, that's a very good point here. I really like it. Just, I think there's a question coming in here um, asking about how has the pandemic changed the job hunting process for fresh, fresh graduates? And what skills are more important now that everything is virtual? I think this question um, can direct to our HR expert, Dinesh. How, how does the job hunting process um, change for fresh grad for now? A quick disclaimer, I'm not an expert yet in HR, <laughs> just to manage expectations. I'm not really an expert, but yeah, I think I can take that question, right? How has job hunting changed? I think if you look at it from a physical manner, obviously what has changed is that most of the interviews and everything is now done virtual. So you don't really have, you know, physical interviews and physical activities and etc. going on. Things have now moved to virtual. So in terms of the competitiveness, I can tell you that the job market now is way more competitive than it used to be because fresh graduates the sad truth is that you will need to be competing with people who have experience like sometimes uh, i see right when when we open up a, a job application let's say it's a fresh graduate applications typically will say that okay maybe preferred candidate is like one to three years of work experience because it's, it's a fresh graduate role and then you have people with like three years experience five years experience applying for the same job and they're willing to take that same pay that we would be giving fresh graduates as well. Um, because, you know, like COVID-19, some people have lost their jobs and et cetera. So I think in situations like this, what really stands out is the qualities that you bring with you as a person. So with my close group of friends, I always say that uh, in this group of friends, I always say that we are the market spoilers, right? Because have you seen some fresh graduates who are really capable of a lot of things, especially when you have like, you know, all these business competitions going on and they have really like all these good experiences. And, you know, for example, being part of MSGA, right? Like you're part of an organization, you get to do a lot of cool stuff. So when you see candidates like that, really, you know, coming out with like super strong ability, these are the market spoilers lah, because these guys will be in a stage where a lot of other fresh graduates will need to compete with them. And that's where the disparity happens. So I think what really needs, what you really need to do is really improving on things that you should be improving on. For example, like I said, data skills or the skills that that particular industry needs. And you need to be very clear about where you want to go and what you want to do, right? Probably like five years ago, if you ask like when whenever fresh grads apply for a role, right? Probably we are applying for a role because we want salary. We want to move forward in our life. I have graduated. I want, I now want the job. But now to my greatest surprise, even when we do interviews for internships, you have candidates who are like, I want to work in FMCG. I want to work in either this company or this company because this, 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 that, that, that. And it's so impressive that at a very young age itself, people are so clear about where they want to go, what they want to do. It's like they can narrate the entire next future, right? And they're so ready for whatever that's coming. So I think this is where as a fresh graduate, you, you will need to step up because it's no longer like, you know, I just want a, a job. And sometimes what people do when you apply for a lot of roles out there, then you get rejected. Uh, you get like constant rejections. It can also mean that you need to work on some other things that you might want to work on. 
So if you ask me, how do you do that? Yeah, I think the, the landscape has changed a lot. Never think as fresh graduates as just being fresh because recent data, a lot of recent articles have now come up, right? Like I remember reading an article by BCG the other day where young graduates are the ones that are being accelerated and having leadership roles and leadership positions. If you know, a lot of companies have launched like graduate trainee programs, management trainee programs, where they accelerate a growth and put you in a management role before like seniors itself. So young graduates are definitely capable. So it's really about how do you get yourself accelerated in that sense. Okay, okay. I really love the way you say um, currently the fresh graduate is not fresh anymore. <laughs> uh, it's really... It, it, the, 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 the industry is really competitive, not only on FMCG, I believe in all the, of the industry. So I was just wondering for Eunice and um, Vicky, because both of you did mention about that you guys change your job during the um, pandemic and, and especially in this very competitive uh, market. How, how do you do that? Probably, uh, Vicky, do you want to share more about your story? Okay, so uh, I switched various reasons. One is uh, I because I was actually sponsored by a company. So I uh, finished uh, servicing my bond after three years. Second one is because I want, I want to move to uh, KL for personal reasons. And the other one is the company that I used to work for, even though it was in a it was a conglomerate, it's a timber and oil palm company, it's quite limited in terms of its uh, talent density. And I felt that uh, even though they do have great talents, but great talents are being stretched and I don't learn directly uh, from them. So that was actually the first time I polished up my LinkedIn profile because before then I didn't have to because I got a job uh, before I graduated. Yeah, so I polished my uh, LinkedIn profile and uh, I got an offer from uh, Sunway Property and it, was, it wasn't through... Um, like an ad uh, on the LinkedIn, someone just shared the job description and then I knew someone uh, from the department, called them up. I actually wanted to work in Subway Education, but then they told me that, oh, they have an availability here. So that's why I got the job. Uh, but, but I am uh, resigning. And uh, this is what I felt from the entire process. I actually feel that sometimes it's easier to uh, switch jobs during the pandemic, uh, don't tell your boss about this, but because while you're working from home, it's easier for you to take calls. It's easier for you to attend interviews, but of course you have to be disciplined during, uh, do it only during your like lunch hour or uh, before or after office hours. Uh, and because of that, I got to know more about uh, other companies and because of joining ELA or the other AYTP uh, programs, my network got a lot bigger and uh, actually two of the job offers I got, I got them within like a month and it's because of the ELA network. Uh, I just wanted to say that this is an example of market spoiler, like you know when I say <laughs> the market so I think Vicky is a good example <laughs> uh, I think I think you did mention quite uh, it's really a life example um to 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 and um to to further touch on about the networking part as well as the LinkedIn branding how how important it is what about you I think you did mention about um you were changing your jobs during the um during the pandemic as well how, how does it happen especially in in this context. Hello, yes. So I don't think you guys should just see this as like just one case story because I personally have uh, my own brother. So my brother is a fresh grad and he's also struggling to actually get employment um, in his specific area, which is audit. But the challenge here is that um, He's very picky. He only wants like ACC approved employers. So that's probably one of the reasons why. Um, but for me personally, it's because I was headhunted twice. So when I was in ADA, I was headhunted by Coke. When I was in Coke, I was headhunted. So that's why I just made the switch. Yeah. I wasn't looking for it. Okay, okay. I see. It's a, it's a very special place um, where Vicky is 
through networking and LinkedIn and units of, of course, personal branding and people are able to headhunt her as well. So I think there's a question um, in the chat mentioning how was the jump from uni to the workforce and what are the biggest changes you have to learn to adapt to? Um, Vicky, do you want to take this? How was uh, the jump from uni to the workforce? I wouldn't say it's uh, very hard because even during your uh, your university studies, you have overcome a lot of uh, challenges, right? So the challenges in terms of the degree, I wouldn't say that it's much harder. It's just different. We just need to get used to it. But there's one key skill that I learned that I did not learn during uh, law school, and that was actually Microsoft Excel. So I definitely resonate with Dinesh. So they don't teach you Microsoft Excel in uh, in law school uh, or even uh, in my uh, master's degree. And what I mean by you know having a very good understanding, be very proficient, it's not just you know how to fill out the cell, how to do a simple calculation. It should be you know how to analyze with uh, Excel, even if you don't have access to uh, BI or Tableau. Uh, and it took me quite a while to uh, master it, I had to do a lot of uh, Googling, uh, but I actually sign up to this course. Uh, it's on Coursera, it's by PwC, Data Driven with Excel, I highly recommend it. Uh, so that would be the challenging part for me. The other part was that uh, because I was put into a department where I reported directly uh, to the chairman, so I didn't have that kind of hand-holding, uh, mentoring sessions uh, with him. It was more like you know meeting a supervisor once a month, if I'm lucky. Uh, usually it's once in two months because he travels too much. So you really need to know how to manage yourself, how to manage your workload, uh, what are the key milestones that you want to achieve because even though maybe initially you think that oh I have so much freedom I can do whatever I want uh, I can experiment here and there you know after a few months you may feel you know you may feel down because you feel that oh I haven't achieved much uh, during these uh, few months here uh, and it's because I've been learning here and there now learning is good but also try to set like uh, key milestones even if it's very small milestones in the beginning they're all worth celebrating Good, good to know. So you did mention about Microsoft Excel again, um, which is, guys, did take note, Excel in your ex Microsoft Excel. <laughs> and also um, you mentioned about uh, having your own personal KPI to really um, measure your goal and measure your career go growth as well. Um, Eunice and Dinesh, do you have any thoughts on this? Like, um, what was the jump looks like from uni to workforce and the biggest challenges? Um, how, yeah, Dinesh? I because I think among three of us, I was the last to jump, right? I was the last to graduate and go into uh, workforce. So I think one thing that a lot of us might not realize, but I was very fortunate that my hiring manager then also uh, had this discussion, right? I remember when I went for the interview, uh, it was very funny because in most of the interviews, the things I talk about are like the Netflix shows I watch, how life lessons I learned from Gossip Girl and Pretty Little Eyes and all of so my my interview, uh, my interview conversations are always very candid and uh, hilarious. So I remember my hiring manager then said that when, when she looked through my resume, when she spoke to me, and that time I was graduating as a valedictorian, and then she said that you, you appear to be a high achiever. You appear to be someone who likes to achieve things, right? Just be careful and be mindful because in a lot of cases where high achievers struggle a lot is that we are not used to failures. You know, sometimes when we are in university, we are always very used to like being the best and we want to do the best and et cetera. But in the workforce, I think no matter how good you are, you will definitely at one point have issues or have challenges. So I think that kind of mentally prepared me to realize that when you have those kind of failures, how are you going to react to this? Because maybe you might not have reacted to that before and et cetera. So I think for me, the biggest and the hardest challenge was adapting to that, that there's a, there's a space where now I am not as good as what I used to think, or I'm completely you know, in a vulnerable spot. Because I studied English language and literature, I, and once upon a time, I thought I'm gonna become a writer. Then I switch, switched into the corporate world, right? I made a big U-turn into the corporate world. So I think at that point, it's, it's really hard for you to finally realize that your world doesn't only revolve around you. There could be a lot of other people who play very essential parts of it. So if you always think that you're really good, you're really great, you know, you have done 101 positions and you have done leading in all this, 
even when it comes to that corporate setting, you might need to find ways to work with people and how do you put your differences aside. So I think that was the biggest learning I had because it made me realize that once again, you're, no man is an island. You really need to find ways to work with people. And trust me, sometimes you need to work with people that you think are incompetent, but you really need to also deal with it. You will not be in a place where every time you're with competent people, right? For example, if you take like, let's say you apply to be part of a student organization, you go through interviews before you're shortlisted. So in that sense, only the high achievers or the competent people are chosen. But what about a world where you also have, you could feel like some people are being incompetent or some of them you're like, oh my God, how did you end up here? Like, how did you even get here? But you need to deal with it, especially if you want to be a leader someday, you cannot pick your followers all the time. So I think that's what, that was the, my biggest learning where I realized that, okay, now I need to restart my learnings and then I need to continuously perform at the same time learn. And I can never say that, oh, I'm still learning because no, no company is going to pay you to learn. Huh? The company will want you to perform and bring results to the table. So how do you draw that balance? Yeah. Wow, it's, 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 it's really well said. It's, it's actually, you mentioned about how to being humble, even if you are in a very, if you think that you're, you're competent or, or in a very um, highly competitive um, space, how to really work with people. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a really good one. What about Eunice? I think, you, well, how, how, how does it change? How does the change look like for you getting into the workforce? Is it, is it hard to get, hard to adapt? Or is it, okay, what, what do you think? Mm, okay, then I have to dial back like seven years ago. <laughs> but I echo with so much of Dinesh's points, um, but I'll just focus on one. So a lot of the things Dinesh said, I totally agree with it. But the one that I'll focus on is maybe, okay, maybe two, two H. So this two H is also kind of going to sound kind of familiar because uh, it's one of uh, Grab's values as well. So there's hunger and there's humility. So for me personally, I... Um, Okay, I'll probably dial back a little bit more than seven years. So I started off uh, as a science student and my mom's plan was for me to be a pharmacist. But obviously after scoring straight A's for SBM, I thought like, oh, I'm the greatest. And then I go to A-levels and I completely flunked it. So A-levels, I did um, math, general, general paper, which is like English, you write essays, uh, bio and chemistry. So I got a D for chemistry. Yes, I got a D for chemistry at A-levels and how is a pharmacist going to get into any universities with a D in chemistry for A-levels? So obviously that door is closed. So if you're still studying, please study hard. If you know what you want to do, uh, don't waste opportunities like that. So what's next with uh, the results that I have? So I was thinking psychology. But my dad said, if you want to study psychology over my dead body, because in Malaysia, that's not going to happen. But that was so many years ago. That's very untrue now. You can go practice psychology because mental health is a serious um, issue. Uh, but a bit sad way there. So what's next? Communications and media management. So that's where I fell in. Fast forward three years, graduated, got an internship. Uh, in the internship, four weeks into the internship, I think I made an impression on the head of digital. Um, and this is tying into the sharings by Mr. Jalil Rashid yesterday. So we had a masterclass yesterday, uh, excuse the plug. Um, <laughs> so he, the recurring thing that he kept saying yesterday was he raised his hand. So how he became a CEO so many times in all the companies is because he always raises his hand. So if there's a project coming, he raises his hand, I want to help or how can I help? So constantly being hungry and have the humility to remember that you're not the best person in the room actually really does help. And for me, it's the internship, four weeks in the internship, I actually got an offer from the head of digital saying, so what's your plan after internship? I'm like, I don't know, maybe go back to Penang. You want to work for us? I'm not sure. Just work for us. Lah. It's, it's fine. You don't have to go job hunting and stuff. So I asked my dad, but dad said, yeah, people offer you a job, stick it. <laughs> so I took the job and that's how I fell into advertising. It's an advertising agency. And ever since then, uh, like the next six years, that's my entire background. It's only recently the past two years that I transitioned to like the client side, but to focus specifically on social media. So in summary, the shift from uni to um, 
workforce is you must always remember that you are sort of the youngest, but that doesn't mean you don't have a voice. You do have a voice. But how you articulate your thoughts and opinions when you're in the room with other people with more experience and all that is to do it in a way uh, that you are humble, you know where you are coming from, but at the same time, you offer a fresh perspective. That's the value you bring. I truly believe in the younger generation is so much better. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. No fear, uh, just just be very willing to learn. Be hungry and be humble. Yeah, that will really help you and bring you very far. Yeah, totally agree. Team working, humility, and staying curious and having humble, which is, I think it's all from our side. So we are currently open for questions. I can see there's a few lined up here. So the first one, I think it's directed to Dinesh from Zihang. Do you want to unmute yourself to us? Um, Okay. Uh, okay. Yep. All right. Um, just now, Danish had said that um, what 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 he said is, if if he look at the candidates LinkedIn profile, he was if there is many things. Um, what 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 I am understanding, <laughs> yeah. Then it will be like messed up or something like that. So, uh, what if we explore more industry? Like for now, we are an uh university students. And we keep trying on, but not specific in one industry. So um, if you were the interviewers who view our profile, do you feel like uh, we are not specialized in particular industry and not professional enough? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Zihan. So I think most of the times people will take chances on you, right? For example, I give you an example where I was an English graduate. I think no, no traditional minded recruiter would be like, why is an English graduate person want to come into the corporate world? Go write for a newspaper or go, you know, become a journalist or something. What do you, what do you want to be in the corporate world, right? So I think what really matters here is your why and your intention. So if, if, you, if you know Simon Sinek, you know his uh, famous quote about always starting with why, right? So I think when we look at any, any candidate, be it a fresh graduate or be it someone who's making a job shift or job hunt, I think usually the question we ask is, why do you want to do this? Like, if let's say if I look at your profile and all the while you've been someone who's into finance, like finance all the way, your degree, everything is in finance, and now suddenly you want to move into marketing. So the question will be like, why do you want to do that? And what do you plan to get out of that, right? So if your profile is interesting and it's something that the recruiter feels like, you should be able to do well in this role because I think in this example, finance, no one, you, you will never go wrong with finance skills. Finance skills will be definitely a value added to wherever you go. So I think for fresh graduates, if you are from different background, I think companies will be will be open to take a shot at you because it's very common. Uh, even in Unilever, the place I work, I have a lot of people who came from like, you know, culinary background, uh, aerospace engineering, and all these people coming into corporate world to do marketing and et cetera, right? So I think it's very common. But you need to be very clear about your why. Like, why do you want to do that? If let's say your why is because you really don't know where you want to go. So you just mind apply to everything. Then I can imagine you getting mind rejected everywhere as well. Because everywhere you go, you're not so clear about what you want to do, where you are headed. So I think spend more time exploring about that particular thing. Like, why are you applying for this role? Why is it important and et cetera, before you go and make it to the interview. So I think initial stage when you apply, you can apply all. But if you make it to the interview, I think what's more important is that particular your why and what's your intention and what do you want to learn out of this. So yeah, feel right. free to come background. I'm pretty sure a lot of good companies would be willing to take a shot. All right, thank you. Yep. Yeah, good. Yunis and Vicky, do you have anything to add on that? Okay. <laughs> um, Next, we will have um, Hasbeni Kaur um, asking a very, very long question. Do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, sorry to be too okay. long. Um, so <laughs> oh, yeah. what you guys have been talking about lately is the standard 9 to 5 for those who are probably like um, auditors or like um, you were mentioning um, doing graphic designing and all that. So what about those um, who do not have a standard 9 to 5 job? or a desk job, which is probably students um, who are in the medical field. 
how would employment work for these students, especially since they need more hands-on experience than most um, other graduates and they aren't able to get this at this current point of time in the pandemic. So how would employment work for them? And because I personally believe that webinars aren't enough and hospitals aren't hiring for internships during this period of time. And organizational certs and experience aren't looked at much unless we are being hired into a medical association as most places want to hire personnel who has had more hands-on experience. Thank you. Okay, I think I will direct this question to Vicky. Okay, I actually wanted to unmute myself. Okay, I, I think it really depends on your goal. Like, uh, so, so I assume you are in the medical field, right? Uh, Hasfin? Is she here? I think she froze. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm in the medical field. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, um, are you studying medicine or like nursing? Or I'm nursing? in my um, final clinical year for veterinary medicine. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's really cool. That's very specific too. Uh, okay, so, so I don't think that... Uh, like, like I can't give like, very good advice in terms of okay, how you can get hands-on experience during this period uh, because I don't have experience in the medical field, but... Uh, let me just uh, share something from uh, uh, the perspective of a uh, startup. So because of the pandemic, there are actually a lot of startups popping up uh, um, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, in healthcare particularly. Uh, so for example, there is this company called Naluri. I don't know whether you've heard about it. Yeah, so, so it's in health tech and they do hire a lot of uh, doctors and I don't know whether they hire uh, like medical students uh, but I do think that this is perhaps another area that you can look into uh, while you are waiting for uh, postings uh, in hospitals. But I don't know much about veterinary science, but maybe perhaps you can find some startups or companies who are in, the, uh, in these fields. And perhaps in the meantime, you can gain some working experience and also because it's from a different perspective, right? Uh, before you actually join, your, uh, join the full-time workforce. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> so yeah, now, uh, but Naluri is not for veterinary science, it's uh, for mental health, but perhaps you can find something similar because I know that they are hiring a lot because they have already raised a lot of funds. Do, okay, Inka, do you mind if I add on a bit? <laughs> yep, yep, go ahead. Um, I was just curious, where are you based, husband? I'm currently in Indonesia. But I'll oh. be leaving in November. That's when I take my oath. Ah, you gotta take your oath then. Where are you gonna take your oath? In in Malaysia, right? Uh, no, in Indonesia. So I have to take my oath here, sit for the general entrance exam, then go back home and sit for the Malaysian exam. I see. Then I get to take my oath in Malaysia. Mm, okay. Maybe okay, one of the things that because based on the your sharing, right, the struggles that I seem to sort of like get from you is that there is no uh, employment opportunities, but that shouldn't stop you from seeking out uh, to do pro bono work. Because the thing is, the thing about pro bono work is that they owe you because you're doing it for them for free. And while you're doing the pro bono work, with the specific company. So you do some research, find out in Indonesia exactly what kind of, because I was thinking if you're based in Malaysia, then you can just reach out to SPCA and help them. But that's in Malaysia. But if it's Indonesia, I'm not too sure what are the organizations that actually deal, uh, that require professionals like yourself. Uh, oh, um, so um, students who are studying in Indonesia can't seek for job opportunities here. So anything I do would have to be done in Malaysia. So I'll probably go for SPC. I see. No, but it doesn't have to be like a job opportunity. Even if it's pro bono, that's still not allowed, is it? Wow, that's uh, true. Not really, unless it's an internship with your university. So. 
Okay, so let's say you scrape, you scrape the internship, you just talk about pro bono work that you're doing for them for the sake of building a relationship with that organization. Yeah, they don't allow it unless allow it's well, under the university. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I guess you have to do that in Malaysia. But mm -hmm. that is one way to go about it, to build relationships with existing people uh, in the industry. So it's also partially personal branding. So they'll know like, oh, how sweet, I know, she's a very sweet girl. She used to help me with all the dogs and stuff. You, you get it? So it's like word of mouth. Um, that could actually help you out as well. Yeah, so don't give up. There's a lot of opportunities as long as you do your research and reach out to people, uh, build relationships. That's very important because building relationships will help you in a very long way, in ways you can't imagine. Like two years down the line, someone says they need somebody like this. Oh, I remember this girl, husband, she used to help me. And then you get a referral. Yeah, I hope that helps. It does. It does. Thank you. Yeah, I got something else to add. Is that okay, Jinkai? Okay, so 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 uh so now you're waiting to come back to uh, Malaysia, and then uh during this period, I think it is quite relevant to what Yunus said. During this period, you can actually build on your personal branding, uh try to reach out uh to as many people as possible, build your network so that you become well known for being you know the girl in veterinary science. So for example. Uh, we can have a lot of identity, we can ha have a lot of uh, profiles, but you need to be unique and also clear uh, with, you know, just one or two identi identity. You don't want to be, you know, uh, you are a global trotter and this and that, okay? People don't know, okay, if you're good in that one specific field. Uh, so, for example, like me, okay, I always call myself like an ad tech enthusiast. And uh, when I introduce myself to people, that's how I brand myself. And then eventually I just get like random calls from, from people or people reaching out to me on LinkedIn. Oh, I know that you're in ad tech. I have a question or I have this uh, opportunity or would you like to collaborate? So uh, don't be like me and wait until you're looking for a job to polish up your LinkedIn profile. You can do it now and uh, establish and also cultivate that network before you actually start working. Okay, good. It's, it's, it's about, okay, I, 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 I'm recurring listening this word personal branding, right? So I think that's a very relevant question about um, personal branding on LinkedIn specifically. I was just wondering, um, this, this question will be directed to Dinesh. How, how, how do you really use LinkedIn as a personal branding platform? I can see that um, Dinesh has like 10K followers in LinkedIn. So how do you do that? Dinesh? Thanks, thanks for exposing, <laughs> exposing me like that, Jinkai. Um, so I think uh, why personal branding matters on LinkedIn is that first, firstly, you, you need to have that identity, right? You need to be known for something that you want to do. And uh, like I said, you, you cannot be this person who wants to be like a global trotter, like globe trotter. And, you know, uh, at, uh, like, at, imagine if I meet, I made a profile that says Vicky Tan, and then the, the things that she puts in a profile is like, I'm a global challenger, shape shifter, you know, I break ceiling, raise the floor. And then, and then suddenly in that way, there's also like this ad tech, uh, ad tech passionate or ad tech enthusiast. So I think I'll be confused, right? Like, like, okay, so what is this girl's deal? Like, what, what, so imagine if now I'm looking for someone in the ad tech field and then I get two profiles. So like one is this like all wannabe and who's like, who gives me that impression of being confused. And another one who's very clear about that I'm into ad tech and why I'm into ad tech. So I think in, in that way that I will favor the person who's very much into ad tech, right? So I think on LinkedIn, you also need to be careful because I'm very aware of, you know, a lot of uh, LinkedIn career gurus that emerge out of nowhere and, and they, they give tips and all. And most of the tips I don't agree with, but I, I don't have the energy to be a keyboard warrior to disagree, right? So I think you need to be aware of the of the advice you take. I remember seeing this one, one post, I forgot who it was, when uh, when they said like, uh, one way to grow your connection is always comment on other people's, uh, other people's posts. And I'm just thinking, how confused can you be? Like, if you're commenting on people's posts just to gain traction or anything without adding value, I personally don't think that's a way to do, right? Imagine if today I post, uh, I post a uh, post talking about how I'm helping uh, uh, an undergrad from an underprivileged society become a better person. And then someone comment like, oh, it's really good what you're doing, super cool, keep it up. Then when I look at the profile, this person says that to everyone's post. Then I'll be like, 
I, I feel very like this person is not being genuine and stuff, right? So I have very strong opinion on stuff like that. But I think what you need to do if you're on LinkedIn is uh, grow your connections and do the right thing. And when I say right thing, I think now every almost every week there's a talk about how to build your LinkedIn career or how to build your LinkedIn profile. So attend those talks and do that. So I think what's important on LinkedIn is to be very clear about what you do, why you do what you do, and what are you passionate about. And then you grow your connections. And sometimes, you know, I will always tell people, look for a mentor. And if you want to look for a mentor, LinkedIn is a good place. Just, you know, connect with them and then tell them that, you know, um, I'm currently looking to uh, venture into so-and-so. And now I'm looking for a mentor. Then will you be able to mentor me? But of course, before you reach out for mentors, be very sure what you want to do. And then be also very clear, right? No point reaching out to 10 people and then you get eight mentors and then you don't go anywhere in your life for the next one year. That also can happen. So I think on LinkedIn, uh, just, just be aware of the personal brand you create for yourself. Because imagine if, let's say, uh, uh, just taking Chris as an example, who was eating guava just now, right? If I remember, if it was him, if I got the wrong person, please forgive me. But uh, whoever that was was eating guava just now. Imagine if I know that person as, oh, I remember this guy was eating guava on a call. Then I go into LinkedIn and all I see is like nothing related to like any professional stuff or anything. So I think our brand is very important and LinkedIn helps you to elevate that. So uh, put, put that up and then just continue growing. So that's how you grow your network and you want to grow it in a meaningful manner. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I saw a lot of um, spam message or spam comments all around. And yeah, you, you did mention about how meaningful kind of conversations do, do matters and also how can we really create value instead of just spamming around, right? So next, Coming out, we do have um, uh, uh, one of the participants, um, Jala. Um, yeah. Do you want to speak up? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, Jin Kai. And yeah, so I'm a, a second year accounting and finance student who is who going to look for the internship opportunities. While I'm building my LinkedIn profile, I find out that I'm not outstanding enough to compete with my peers. And they actually participate in lots of competitions. They actively being enough in many, many events. And to be honest, I personally don't think I'm able to do it to achieve such a wonderful achievements because in the meantime, I have to juggle with my studies, right? So yeah, I, I need your advice and that's my question. Jinka, you're muted. Jinka, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, Vicky and Eunice, do you have any thoughts on this? And of course, Dinesh. Mm, okay, I can personally resonate with your struggle because my brother is a graduate from accounting and finance and he is also struggling with employment opportunities and he has the same struggle because I think most of the peers uh, also may be more outstanding, which is why he doesn't get uh, the opportunities. But I don't think that what is on your paper matters your interview process and how you actually answer the questions during the interview matters a lot more. So I'll just share a little bit. Okay, I do a lot of hiring as well on the side over the years. And over the years, I, I have stopped looking at resumes. So if I get a resume, it passes to me. I just roughly know the name. Sometimes I don't even remember the name because there's so many candidates. I just go into the interview. The camera is on. The person starts speaking. And when the person starts speaking, I already start evaluating the person. I try my best not to have any biases, but a lot of the conversations I have with this person throughout the interview process to understand where they're coming from, the experience, they will have to verbalize and sell themselves during the interview. So I don't think it's so much of um, your qualifications. I think you are you are spending a Sunday right now over here with us when you could actually be doing something else. And I would say that that effort itself already proves that you are not average, you're above average. So what you could actually work on, uh, my recommendation to you is to actually polish up your interview skills. So prepare yourself, um, present yourself in a way to be desirable to the employer, uh, have confidence and be assertive knowing what you want. 
have like a five year projection goal of saying, oh, by this, I want to do this. this these are my goals. Justify your passions, share your why. And I think that would actually make that slight difference. Yeah, I hope that helps. Dinesh, do you want to add on something? Yep, uh, I can I can just add on just two things. Uh, Jala, if I get your name, if I got your name right, I just uh, call Jala, right? So I think the first, uh, like I said, there are a lot of market spoilers, right? These people who are way better and etc. So I think if it's good that you already acknowledge that, to be honest, you're on a great start because you are aware that you have, in that sense, you might not be outstanding, right? So my next question to you is, what do you plan to do about it? Like, are you going to not do anything about it and then you just graduate and then only you start thinking about it? Or I don't know, you, are, you said you're in second year, right? So you still have like one year to go if I got right. So if I was in your position, I will then look for opportunities that I think I can also grow myself and I can also do things. So uh, feel free to sign up for ULDP. It's called University Leadership Development Program. Uh, it's organized by our Zeta Young Talent Program. I can tell you, uh, Jin Kai, myself, and also Aaron was from that program, and that program was life changing for me. But I think that's a good place for you to start if you want to sign up for those programs and etc. So that's the first thing, right? And the second thing is also be very aware of what does this decision uh, say about you. For example, just now you said something like, "Oh, I, I can't join this." competitions because I'm focusing on my studies, right? So in an interview, if you say something like that, you will come off as someone who can't multitask. Or if, it, if you can, you'll come off as someone who can't juggle too many things at the same time. So, so be aware of, you know, how can you make the most out of a university life and etc. It doesn't have to be any business competitions. I never, part, I never took part in any of those competitions because that was not where my passion was. But if I was a finance and accounting student, then probably I will channel more energy to get an internship. In, in, a, in a big four audit firm and et cetera. And from what I know, usually internships are relatively chill. Like people hire interns in a, in a more flexible manner as compared to like a permanent role, right? So I think in those kind of situations, you can also grow your uh, channel that energy into doing that, where you can probably do an internship or you can probably take part in any other competitions. Or if you don't want to do competitions, probably a club and society, if you want to organize something, get, get involved in industry leaders, you know, do a session where you invite people from the big four, for example, build your network, and then that will also somehow help you in the long run. So it doesn't have to be competitions or anything. You can also do the same thing that gives you the same impact through other ways. But it's good that you've acknowledged it. So I'm pretty sure you'll just, from where you started, you'll only start to grow. So all the very best. Yeah, thank you, Dinesh and Eunice. That's a really good one. And yeah, I appreciate it. All right, good. I think there's another question coming um here, mentioning about how do you guys um why do you guys want to join ELA like um having a side project, um even though you guys have your own commitments and your your work and a lot of stuff going on with your busy schedules. What would you want to, to join ELA as a committee as well? Um, I just hope I, I yeah, forced them. I was just I was just gonna say I hope no one says I forced them to do it <laughs> because I know you. Wiki and you, right? So it's like, I hope no one says that. No, I'm just kidding. But I think probably uh, Wiki, you can, you, can, you can say your why. Uh, so for me, it's uh, two main reasons. Um, so because I never lived in uh, KL before, I'm originally from Sarawak. Uh, so uh, joining like ELA and also the AYTP Wider Society allows me to build my network and to, I know it sounds sad, to make more friends. And I'm very glad to meet people like Eunice, Dinesh, and Jinkai, whom I can call my, you know, close friends. The other reason is that, yeah, I know that we all have very busy schedule, but everyone has very busy schedule. And I don't think it's right to, you know, compare one person's schedule with another person's schedule. But what I believe is that, uh, you know, if a full-time uh, working mother can do it, I can definitely do it, right? I mean, there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to do it. So that's why I uh, take on some projects, uh, joining ELA, because I want to prove to myself that uh, I can actually do it. I can multitask, deliver uh, various projects uh, concurrently. And it allows you to build your confidence because maybe before you do it, you feel like, oh, there are lots of challenges. Uh, probably you don't have the capabilities to make it work. 
Uh, but once you're in there, and I'm lucky enough to have very good support system, uh, it does help me to, uh, to deliver uh, all the uh, projects uh, in the given timeline and also help me to know that, oh, I can do this rather than just doing it on my own. Yep, that's, I resonate with that a lot. What about you, Eunice? Okay, confession time. <laughs> so like, um, okay, this is gonna look bad and this session is recorded. How, uh, should I say this or should I not say this? Okay, so basically, right, how I actually, I'll just cut, I'll cut the part that I don't wanna talk about and just focus on the reason why I joined ELA. Um, the purpose is actually to give back. I, I'm, I'm a Christian and servant leadership is a principle that I subscribe to. And I'm very grateful for the opportunities that Axiata has given me throughout the two years when I, I was with uh, YCDP. And I felt, I felt so grateful to the point that I have to do something. I have to give back. How? How can I give back? So that's why I joined the council. So I wanted to serve uh, the council and all the other members who actually volunteered their time, their free time. They hand chill and relax, but instead decide to dedicate their time to actually uh, give value and bring amazing events for our alumni. So I wanted to be part of that as well. That's why I'm in the council. And yes, I have very hectic schedules as well. But like Wiki said, you can't compare your schedules with other people. We all have different lives, we have different commitments. I have a brother at home, which I have to cook for. And um, Settle is crazy. It's a, it, it's, it's a startup and we're expanding. There's a lot of campaigns going out in September. It's crazy. But I believe that if you are very clear on your why, you can pull through. You know the reason why you're doing this. You always have that focus to come back to, like, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want to help, I want to serve, I want to grow and nurture other people as well. Yeah, it doesn't, you don't spin out of control if you always have your why. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree, Eunice. For me, myself, I joined ELAs is because I found that the community, it's really strong. It's not only like um, focused on student itself, but also focus on the um, young graduate. So me as a student, I am able to engage with um, young professionals like Dinesh, Unis and Vicky at a very young age, which I found that it's really important to get a lot of industry insights at an early age. So that's, um, that's something about myself. So what about you, Dinesh? <laughs> right. Uh, so I think for me, though, there were many reasons, right? And uh, to start off, uh, I'm a firm believer that you, you don't, your, your, your qualities does not change over time, right? So when I was in high school, I, I spent, uh, I think 70% of my school attendance was outside of my classroom. I was in all those competitions. I was always out in, in schools and everything. In university, it was the exact same thing. I think most of my time I spent outside of my classroom as well. Um, I was in a few organizations. I, I did a few events and I was always outside of the classroom. And when I started going into my work, I needed a life outside of work. So even though I, I'm a workaholic, I work like crazy at times. And sometimes, you know, I, I work from like 8 a.m. up to like 12 a.m. and stuff. But I think I need that, that thing to do outside of work to give me the sense of achievement, that sense of purpose. And what gives me happiness is always bringing changes in people or impacting communities. So when I have that as my life's purpose, right, I always believe that my purpose is to be a game changer and help those who need help and to be better than who they are. I think Emerging Leaders Asia was the right place for me to be because I had to, I can do a lot of stuff to impact a lot of our alumni who would want to improve themselves and become better. So I don't think being in this position is going to give my resume a, a fancy look, right? Or probably I'm already working, so I don't even know if people are going to be looking at my resume next if I'm going to apply for a job. But I think what it does is it allows me to experiment a lot of things like it allows me to test things like, okay, if let's say I want to coach this person, should I take this approach or that approach and etc. And because of all these crazy things I've done outside work, that's why, that's why people in my office know me as well. They always know that this guy can never chill. This guy is like everywhere. And he just cannot just stay still and etc. Right. So I think um, that's why I joined Emerging Leaders Asia and I became the president because I think uh, as a leader, you, you really want to I think I, I've done enough to develop myself. I want to develop others while I still can. 
So even though I'm young, I'm probably one of the younger ones in, in, in the council, I still think that I, I can uh, shape people and allow them to grow and give them all those flexibility and see them grow. So at the end of the day, when, when they have grown and they have really done something great, I think that's why I feel really proud to be uh, who I am today. So I think that's why I joined Emerging Leaders Asia and I'm continuing uh, my service here. That's, that's really good. Uh, Nash Junius and Vicky is really know the why behind you joined the ELA. So just a, um, a, a little bit of brief introduction of the ELA. So all of us are actually alumni for Akhtata Young Talent Program. So you can see in the chat box, Vicky did um, send you guys the link. So if you are a university student, you can join a two weeks um, event, um, trainings as well, um, which is called ULDP, University Leadership Development Program. So if you are currently um, graduated and you are a young professional, just get or fresh graduate, you can get into YCDP, which is um, <laughs> young I don't know, the Young CEO, young development, CEO yeah. development Program. <laughs> yeah, Young CEO Development Program. So um, we want, we, we um, as, as an alumni, we, we really wanted to build a talent pipeline for CEO. So um, if you guys are interested, um, do apply because they have just opened up um, the sign up application again. But before before that, um, before I close up everything, um, probably Vicky, Eunice and Dinesh, do you want to give um, the youth here, um, the participant here, some final advices um, to close it up. Um, probably let's start with um, Vicky. Um, so I guess I've already shared like uh, most of the things that uh, I want to share, but in terms of final thoughts, right? What I really believe that at this young age, you, are, you can afford to take risks. Okay, so, so have faith in yourself. Try something outside of your comfort zone. I mean, when, when I was, when I was uh, quite young, I actually uh, attended this seminar and then it was titled, What You Really Want Is Outside of Your Comfort Zone. And I believe in this because I thought that my comfort zone was in law. <laughs> so I actually tried it. But then I tried something else. I realized that I was more interested in their business problems than their legal problems. So try as much as you can. Uh, do lots of internships. Um, and if you have the opportunity to join organizations, just do it. Uh, in terms of your scheduling and all that, you can actually think about that later. Uh, and what's good is you do have a support system. And when you do need help, do reach out to the people who can offer uh, the help that you need. Yep, so that's it from me. Yeah, what about you, Eunice? Mm, I have a few actually, so I'll just share everything. Now. So the first one is if you are a reader, so you read books, um, if the book sucks, don't finish it. Just put it down because your time is worth so much more. So yeah, and try to read books that are recommended, not because uh, the book is like famous or something, but if it's recommended, read it. And if you stumble upon a book, but halfway reading or quarter way through, you feel like this book isn't for you and you're just struggling to finish it, you don't enjoy it, there's no point, just put the book down. That's one of the advice. Second thing is like we, what Wiki said, try everything. So trying everything and uh, being a bit more capo, uh, busybody. So in the sense that it's actually a good thing because when you're busybody, it's also slash curious and you find out more things, you get to know a little bit about everything. And this goes into my point of networking. And I'm not saying like networking in the sense like uh, you go for networking events, that's not that's not like actual networking because networking for me is about building relationships. And the best way to do that is actually to embed yourselves in different experiences. So if you can pick up a sport, pick up a music, pick up a new language, uh, attend Duolingo meetups, go play sports with a bunch of people who like sports, go hiking, find a group that hikes and go, go attend an art class, find artsy people, go to watch a drama show and surround yourself by different peoples from different walks of life because you will get a shared experience from these people and the knowledge transfer is like so much faster because you're also exposed to a variety of people, a variety of cultures who come from different parts of the world, different parts of life. And as a person, you grow 
and you become more desirably uh, on a global platform because you're very adaptable. Like you're in, you're everywhere. It's pretty much like the niche. So those are the two advices that I can leave with you. Yep. All right, sweet, Sean and sweet. I love that. Dinesh, over to you. Right. Uh, thanks, Jinkai. So I think uh, I, I say a lot on LinkedIn all the time, so I wouldn't want to repeat myself. But two things I would want to just leave you with. Uh, the first thing I always tell everyone is, if you are the best in the room, find another room. If you are the best in the circle, find another circle. Never be complacent where you are, because the more complacent you are, then you're not actually growing, and that will just put you one step backwards. So that's one. And number two is that always be curious, always be hungry, hungry for knowledge, hungry for curious and all, right? By the same time, always be kind as well. And kindness is not only to how you are to others, but also be kind to yourself. And one way of being kind to yourself is really do things that benefits you. Have your me time, you know, don't, don't overlook fitness. I think fitness is a big part of wherever you are. And that's something that I regretted as well, not picking up early. So I think those are things that you can really do and explore yourself, but continue growing and continue reaching greater heights. So once you've done one milestone, uh, go for the next one. It's okay if you fail, you are, you can, you're, you, you should be able to take risk and fail at this point rather than failing later, which will have very severe negative consequences. So yeah, I hope, I hope that helps. Yeah, definitely. I myself learned a lot through three panelists, um, Eunice, Vicky, and Dinesh. I'm not sure about you, but I do take a lot of notes from them, which is really great. Um, just to end up here, um, Imagine Leaders Asia do have a public event every month for master classes where we invite um, different um, CEOs from different sector um, or the senior leaders from different sector to share their experience um, each month. So stay tuned on our Instagram. And another thing, it's actually Future CEO Summit, which we will have it each year we have it early this year april and there will be another one next next april uh, around that time yeah so do um follow our instagram and um stay tuned and okay i think chris is here to take over right we, we would like to have a group picture probably yes yes thanks yeah. the session is ending really soon so yeah my critic here jingyi will be taking a photo everyone do on your cameras what cams if possible let's Take a quick photo and then go back to the main room. Okay, I'll give everyone 30 seconds to open the cameras. Please do so. Okay. Come on, everyone. Let's, because this will be going on our social media platforms. So it'd be nice to have everyone open the cameras if possible. Okay, I think I think Jingyi, you can take your photo now. Okay, mm. so we will go on with the first page first. Mm. So, right. three, two, one, smile. Okay, and the second page, three, two, one, smile. And the last page, three, two, one. Yeah, okay. Mm. Thank you, ELA and all the speakers. Mm. So I think we can return to the main room. So thank just you much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Just click the leave room and leave the breakout room. Okay, see you guys back in the main room. Okay, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys.